We need tonight. We thank you again for this opportunity to just worship you and study your word. We just pray, Lord, that you just give your servant the words that need to be said. Just uh, be with each and every one that's here. We just pray that you can get Ruth and Teddy's cars fixed and just all those that need you, need you for your healing touch, Lord, just be with them. Be with the that uh, Estes there, Evelyn Estes there. Just be with her and just all those, Lord, that's on our prayer list. Just be with them and put your healing touch on them. And just all those that, whatever the issues may be that's going on in their lives. And Father, we just ask your blessings on this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's right. We're doing, uh, looking at continuing our series on Zephaniah. And this will be part six, and Zephaniah part six. And we left off, we have one more verse left in chapter two. So we're going to be looking at Zephaniah chapter two and verse 15. Zephaniah chapter two and verse 15. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How has she become a desolation, a place of, a place for beasts, to lie down in. Everyone that passes by her shall hiss and wag his hand. Now, Nineveh, as I said, was once a great city. And we kind of looked at uh, the last verse as we were talking about Nineveh. And remember, that's the capital of Syria and so forth. But, you know, as I said, Nineveh was once a great city in the capital of Syria and at one time the world's largest city. Now, this was a city feared by many nations as the Syrians were evil. Nineveh was the city that Jonah was sent to preach repentance to the people. They did repent, so God preserved them for a while. But eventually the new generation went back to their sinful ways, and so God destroyed the city just as he warned he would. You know, this is seen in remember where Jonah went there, and then the conclusion of it is in Nahum. You know, that's, that's the problem with a lot of people is they repent for a little while, but then when things start going well again, then they quickly go back to their old ways. You know, people are quick to forget. You know, even like, remember like 9-11 when that happened, then people all of a sudden, like for a week or two, everybody seemed to go to church. And after that, it's like, all right, well, yeah, man, let's just go on their life. And that, that's the attitude of most people. And it, it's, it's not, excuse me, just here in the United States. I mean, it's all over the world. And, and, it, and it's been like that from the time that man's been on the earth. That, you know, the Syrians were no different. But as I said, you know, they did repent, so God preserved them a while. But then this new generation came up, went back to the simple ways, so God destroyed the city just so he warned he would. You know, and God will fulfill whatever prophecy he says. He's going he's gonna to do it. You know, he may postpone things, but he's ultimately going to do whatever he says he's going to do. You know, that's why even here in the United States of America, you know, we all need to repent, so maybe God will postpone some of his judgment. But judgment is coming to this nation, just like it did with Assyria. But, you know, we saw that was just kind of the same thing, even with uh, when we were studying the Genesis on, you know, with Noah, the people for the flood. Then they all, or not sorry about the flood, but I'm thinking about uh, with Joseph, you know, with, with the, the Israelites. Then Joseph, when he was king of, the, you know, the second command there of Pharaoh, then, you know, everybody, you know, they were all great. You know, everybody was, you know, going along with the Israelites. Well, then all of a sudden the Pharaoh died off and new Pharaohs came around. And then new generation, they long forgot what Joseph had done for the nation of Egypt. And, you know, then that's when they wanted to get rid of the Israelites and ultimately, you know, you know, the templates and so forth. But the people, you know, going back to Nineveh here, the people were able to postpone the destruction due to true repentance. But as I said, ultimately God will fulfill his word. And as I said, the same is going to happen here in the United States. That, you know, sooner or later, God will judge America as he has these nations. You know, we're no, no exception just because we think we're a, quote, Christian nation or anything else. You know, Israel was God's chosen people, but yet he, he punished them over and over and over again. He led them off to captivity. They didn't have a nation for, you know, 1900, almost 1900 years. So, you know, don't think that we're any different than, than any of these other nations. You know, we're not exempt from God's wrath any more than Judah was. But we see in this verse how Nineveh said there was none like here and her pride. There was none like her and her pride 
thought she would better than God. Now God made her a home for beasts, just as was done to many other nations and cities in Scripture. You know, oftentimes you see that when God will say he'll, he'll make something desolate, you know, with uh, the city of Tyre or some other ones. And, and then it's always talks about it's a place for the beast to go there. Well, the thing is, yeah, it's just talking about physical beasts, the, you know, the animals and so forth. But in Scripture, that when they refer to those beasts, oftentimes it's also it's a place where the devils take over. You know, they like all that stuff. So, you know, they, they basically, have, God has just given it over to them. Now, no nation can escape God's wrath if they disobey or become too arrogant as Assyria had become. Now, today, the Assyrian Empire is long gone, as is the nation of Assyria. Now, note that the nation of Assyria was a separate nation from the nation of Syria, which still exists today. You know, if you study scripture, there's Assyria and there's Assyria. You know, there, there's two different nations there. So... You know, don't confuse them with Syria is still here today, but us Syria is gone. Now, what happened to Assyria and all these nations should be a warning to all nations today who try to defy God. You know, there's many nations, you know, all these communist nations that they going on, whether it's China, Russia over the years, when they're, especially when they're Soviet Union or, or um, you know, North Korea, you know, you name all these places. Uh, it it, it, it their, their doom is coming. But now these prophecies to these nations were to have been a warning to Judah to repent and avoid her own destruction. You know, again, God always tries to give his people plenty of ample time. You know, look, the, look before the flood, how much time the people had before, uh, you know, God actually brought on the flood. You know, they had many, many years to repent and they refused. And, you know, God gave Israel many, many warnings before he'd do things. You know, and it's the same thing here, he gave him one more warning where he was going around destroying many of these other nations that were their enemies, and then he, they still didn't want to repent, you know, even though he said it was come to them. That, that they, again, they just thought it was, well, we're God's chosen people, that he wouldn't really destroy us. Well, let's, uh, let's move over to chapter 3 now. So Zephaniah chapter 3, this is the last chapter, it's only a three-chapter book, so. But Zephaniah... Chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressive city. So God approved Zephaniah and now turns his attention and warnings back to Judah, and in this verse specifically to Jerusalem, a city that had become polluted by idolatry, prostitution, sodomy, and many other things. Now, Jerusalem, as the city of God, was supposed to shine brightly to the rest of the world, but had become filthy and polluted as she became worse than some of the Gentile cities. So, you know, this first, like I said, it may have been deal with just Jerusalem itself, but, you know, it, it, it was a, it's a, Jerusalem as the capital is kind of a picture of the whole nation. You know, that Jerusalem was here, it was, they were God's chosen city, but yet they had just turned over to idolatry and all this other filth and so forth that they had. You know, it talks many places in Scripture where Judah actually became worse than the nation of Israel. You know, as much as Israel was, was bad, it says that Judah became worse, and it talks about Jerusalem, the same thing, where Jerusalem became worse than Samaria, which was the capital of Israel. And, you know, like I said, in a lot of ways... You know, it's the same thing they talk about even in the New Testament with the Christians, the uh, Corinth, the Christians in Corinth, the, of Corinth, you know, in some of those places, you know, they were more doing things than even the Gentiles, you know, the other unsaved people. And here, like, they were doing things the Gentile nations weren't doing, you know. So it, it just shows you how people get too, too uh, complacent or whatever when they think that, because they're a Christian, or this or that, or they're God's chosen people, in the case of Israel or something, that, you know, they can get away with whatever. But, you know, Paul said, does that mean we have the right to sin? And, and, and he says, God forbid, you know, that just because we're saved doesn't mean we have free reign to sin, just because we can confess our sins to Jesus. But let's look at uh, verse 2, Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 2. 
She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. So Jerusalem refused to obey the voice of God through his prophets. Nineveh did for a while from Jonah and was spared for a time. Whereas Jerusalem ignored God's warning, warnings and in fact killed many of the prophets. That's what I said. I mean, here you had, you had this heathen city in Nineveh. And even, even the king, remember, they all put sackcloth on. Even the animals, he had them put sackcloth on the animals. That, you know, everybody repented. But yet, what does Jerusalem do? They're going around killing the prophets. I mean, they had no desire to even try to repent. You know, she, she did not even ever try and truly correct herself. There was at times some false outward appearance of change, but then she became so wicked she did not even try to appear holy. You know, that's how a lot of people have come. They get to the point where at first they try to hide their sin, but then they just become so sinful, they don't even try to hide it anymore. You know, I mean, whether it's somebody that's a professor Christian or just whoever it may be, even if they're not necessarily a Christian. But it's just, it gets to the point where people don't even try to hide it anymore. And that's how, how Jerusalem had become. Is it, that she didn't even try to hide anything anymore. But Jerusalem had long stopped trusting in the Lord but rather trusted in false gods, you know, mainly Baal and so forth and the other ones. She did not draw near to God as she served false gods. Now she had lost all love for the true God. Let's look at Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 3. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Now this verse shows that the princes and the rest of the royalty are roaring lions. Now just as a roaring lion devours his prey, so have the princes, the people. You know, in fact, many nations, you know, the for royalty, their their symbol is the lion. So it's also kind of ironic, you know, or, or you know, whatever that you know how they get compared here. But but their sinfulness has caused the people to become wicked. That, you know, I'm referring to the princes here of the, of the people. And, you know, and that's the thing. is the leaders, you're supposed to be better than, than, the, than the others. But God compares the judges of Jerusalem as evening wolves. Now, wolves are dogs. And in Scripture, dogs never have anything good said about them. Wolves dress the sheep to deceive people. And that is what these judges have done as their wickedness shows forth in the morning. As they gnaw on the bones of people, having already devoured their flesh and led them to a life of sin and away from God. You know, and the wolves do their sin at, at night as they fear the lions. Night is when most sin occurs. And I've talked about that before, but, you know, that, that it's just a common theme. Like I said, you talk to any, any policeman or anything like that, as soon as it gets dark, that's when things really start getting bad. And, um, but I mean, you know, look at these comparisons. You got the princes are referred to as roaring lions, the judges as evening wolves. You know, and as I said, that, that's not compliments there that, that God's trying to give these people. It just shows how wicked all of their leaders were, whether it was the judges or the princes. You know, we could say the same thing about our nation. You know, our judges are the same way, and, and so are the, uh, the, we don't have princes, but, you know, the, the Congress, the president, and, you know, so forth, then, you know, that'd be like our princes. And then, of course, all the judges. And, you know, the same thing can be said about our nation. That's exactly how we are. We're, we're, we're just like them. Well, let's look at uh, Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 4. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Now the phrase, quote, her prophets are light, refers to false prophets not from God. Now these men have no fear of God or real desire to see change and repentance of the people. You know, and that's, that's how most people are. Like I said, they don't really have a desire to ever change. You know, you, you can preach and preach and preach and do whatever. You know, and people all they all claim that, you know, they're they're whatever. You know, here these people were claiming to be prophets. 
but they were false prophets. You know, there, there's a lot of them out there. And, you know, they didn't really, all they wanted is control and the power. You know, they don't, they don't have any desire to see change and repentance of the people. Now, these false prophets are traitors as they pretend to be from God, but lead the people to destruction. You know, and, and they were just like a lot of people today. They have no fear of God whatsoever. That they, they uh, just went about their sins, like I said, as if it was no big deal. But the priests have polluted the sanctuary as they perform sacrifices to these fa the false gods. So they're in there polluting the, the sanctuary because they're offering all these these sacrifices, to, they, they, like I said, they had these many idols, you know, such as Baal and uh, what was the other one, like Marduk or whatever, and all these other ones and stuff. They they they, they weren't worshiping and putting these sacrifices to the true God. So you know, they had corrupted the temple and so forth. It's going to be just like the Antichrist will do in the future. But the priests have, uh, and the people have continued to disobey God's law. As they made a mockery of it. You know, they just made it into just like it's a joke. Like I said, they just had no respect for it whatsoever. They just continued in their sin and, and, and just mocked basically, you know, God's commands, commandments. Now the priests have changed the meanings of the law to cover the sins of themselves and the people. And no one observes the law. Now Zeph Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 5. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. So verse 5 shows that the Lord, you know, that's Jehovah, is there among the people and he will do no iniquity. Iniquity is sin. That means sin. Now every morning God brings his judgment to light. You know, as I said, people, they do all these things at night thinking they're getting away with everything, but then God shines that light on them and, and points out their sins, what they've done. You know, uh, the, the mafia members always were big on that. You know, people in the mafia, although Roman Catholics, you know, the Roman Catholics all think they could just go to a priest, you know, confess their sins, and then they're okay. So they go all do all their nasty stuff at night, their crimes and so forth. And priests have said all the time, then first thing in the morning, they'd all come in and confess their sins. So they were good to go. So if they died later on, and then they could go back out that night and start all over again. You know, and like I said, it's not what God's word says. You can't just keep sinning, you know, and think, well, I confess my sin. No, you didn't really repent if you just continuously keep doing the same thing over and over. But God will not hide his judgment. You know, we've talked about before, you know, up on the rooftops and everything. It's going to be proclaimed from the rooftops and things. But the unjust have no shame and do not even try to hide their sins anymore. And as I said, this can be seen here in America today. You know, even among our leaders. You know, they're, 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 there's just no shame on, on the things that they say or do. You know, but this verse shows God as the judge and how he was righteous compared to the sinful judges in verses 3. So, you know, God is a righteous judge. He judges right in everything he does. Whereas those judges in verse 3, you know, they were, they made not, none of their decisions were, were righteous. They were, you know, unholy in everything they did. All right, let's take a look at uh, verse 6 here. So Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 6. I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste that none passeth by. Their cities are destroyed so that there is no man, that there is no, there is none inhabitant. In this verse, we see God says he has cut off the nations that have been enemies of Israel. Now God many times destroyed the nations who were enemies of Israel, and Israel and Judah both knew this. Yet Judah thought she could do whatever sin she wanted and God would not destroy her. Now no nation, including Judah, is above sin. The people of Judah doubted God and were not even thankful 
for what God had done for them the many, many times they were attacked. You know, how many times read in Scripture where, you know, they were being attacked by an enemy and God would miraculously get in there and so forth. You know, we're going to see some of this stuff. It's going to happen in the future Sunday night in my sermon. But we'll, um, you know, it's just over and over. And, and, and the thing is, they were not thankful. And America's the same way. I mean, how many times has, you know, since our founding, has God blessed us, whether it was even in, you know, the, the wars we were in or just whatever it may be, and Americans are just some of the most unthankful individuals out there. Um, let's see. But God, God shows in the rest of the verse how he made the towers of these nations desolate, the streets were waste and empty, the cities were destroyed, and they were empty and uninhabited. So not only did he, he the cities, they were empty, but they were completely destroyed. You know, there was no nobody living there at all. They were completely uninhabited. You know, the streets were a waste. There's nothing there. But, you know, as I said, you know, where Judah thought they were above sin, you know, I already mentioned how, you know, they actually became worse in their in her sin than, than Israel, the ten tribes, northern tribes of Israel were. But Zephaniah, let's take a look at verse 7. So Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 7. I said, surely thou wilt fear me. Thou wilt receive instruction, so their dwelling should not be cut off. Howsoever I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. Now in this verse, we see how God did not want to destroy these nations, as he was hoping they would fear him. Instead of fearing God, they got deeper in sin. You know, so like I said, they, they, they kept having all these warnings and, you know, God's telling them all these things, but instead of, you know, fear of God, you know, it's the same thing that's going to happen during the tribulation. These people, they, they know God's doing, you know, all these, you know, that God is real, and there's these uh, different things that are happening, all these judgments and so forth like that. But yet the people just got greater in their sin rather than turning to God. Well, it's the same thing here where the people, they just kept getting deeper and deeper in sin, is because they just had no fear of God, and that's what happens. We have no fear of God, anything and everything goes. You, know, you you start to enjoy sin after a while when you do it, and so if you have no fear of God, you just can keep getting deeper and deeper into it. You know, that's why, you know, the little sins, you know, everybody calls them the little sins. Well, in God's eyes, there are no little sins, because those so-called little sins are what lead you into bigger sins, because you think, well, I got away with all I did, so I just... You know, did this one? Well, I took a pen. You stole a pen or something, so it was no big deal. Well, then the next time you steal something else, and then that leads you into it was something else, and you know, all these sins start compounding on one another. But these nations were warned by God, but they ignored them. Even when God punished them to give them a wake-up call, they continued in their sin, corrupted all their doings, as it says. So God had to destroy them. Now, this includes Israel, who ignored all his prophets and was dispersed among the nations. Remember, Assyria came in there and excuse me, captured um, Israel, and those people got dispersed. You know, instead of bringing them back to, you know, leaving some of the people there or taking them back to Assyria, they purposely, because they hated the people and they wanted them to be destroyed, they threw some over here in the kingdom, some over here, and so forth. And, you know, that's what a lot of uh, nations would do when you had these empires. You would purposely start spreading them out. You know, that'd be like saying, just say, uh, you're in Europe, for example. So you'd throw some in France, some in England, some in, you know, down in uh, somewhere else, you know. that You would spread them all out because, that you know, if the thing is, if people are spread out, they can't get back together to try to retake, you know, get them, you know, regain their freedom. You know, it's like anything. If you have a bunch of gang members, you want to break them up and disperse them so that, you know, there's only a few of them they can't regain as a group because, you know, you have more power as a group. It's the same thing with them. They didn't want the people to be able to, you know, regain their freedom. But it also helps if you just spread everybody out. You lose your culture a lot more. If you, if you end up where, you know, a bunch of us all get spread out here and there, 
you start adapting to the local coast culture. So now if all of a sudden well, we're, we're speaking English and then somebody else is speaking Spanish, some other group is speaking French or whatever, then, you know, after a while, they lose that, that, that uh, identity, you know, that cultural identity. But, you know, that's the thing that shows that you know, there is a God. It's the fact that Israel, even with all that dispersion, you know, Israel still has re retained all of its identity. You know, where, where other nations in history, that, that's not seen. But as I said, you know, they, these nations ignored all the wake-up calls. You know, Syria had all them prophets and so forth. And they did the same thing, killed them. And so God destroyed them all. Now, this includes, as I said, Israel. And then Judah was soon to get her turn for her disobedience. And America will also soon get her turn. Now, I don't necessarily say, and I'm looking forward to I, I want God to destroy this nation. But it, it's just a matter of time. You can't keep living in our sins the way, I mean, if God destroyed those nations, we're not any better than them. Then. So, you know, God's going to do us the same way. It's just a matter of time. You know, Judah did learn from what happened to the 10 northern tribes. And apparently we're not learning from what happened to Israel or anything else in history either. But we too have ignored all the warnings such as 9-11. You know, America's had, especially since 9-11, that was kind of God's kind of wake up call, really, I think. And it's just gotten that much worse, different things have happened. And, you know, instead of getting closer to God, America's just getting more and more every day farther and farther away from God. You know, that we're not looking at the warning signs that, that God's given us. Let's look at uh, verse 8. So it's F9, chapter 3, and verse 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prayer. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So in verse 8, God turns back to Judah and Jerusalem. He tells the people to wait on him, for the day will come when God will rise against the nations as he assembles the kingdoms, and they will be devoured in his fierce anger. Now this is a promise to Judah that though they will be sent into captivity, there will come a day when God will restore them, and the people will turn back, to him and all of Israel and Judah's enemies will for once and for all be destroyed. You know, that's going to be during the millennium. We know ultimately that's what that's, going to, that's what that's pointing to. You know, until that day, Israel's going to have many enemies. And of course, during the tribulation, the whole world's going to turn against her. But during the millennium, she'll finally have that peace, that true peace that you know God had promised. She'll have all the land that she's entitled to, and she'll no longer have enemies. But the, the verse initially is, is pointing to the battle of Armageddon at the end of the Great Tribulation. You know, at, at the end of this battle, God will destroy all of Israel's enemies with the fire of his jealousy for Israel. You know, remember all these people, you know, trying to meet in, in Israel to attack and, you know, they're trying to destroy. But, you know, God's going to intervene there. And, you know, of course, that's when he comes down in his second coming and, you know, puts an end to the battle. But Israel themselves will finally turn to Jesus as the Messiah at the end of the Great Tribulation and will finally be right with God. You know, I, I've said that, I've preached that before, but I mean, there are many people that that occasionally, you know, there are obviously some Jewish people that get saved, and hopefully there'll be a lot more. But as a nation as a whole, they're an unsaved nation. And, you know, it won't be till that end of the Great Tribulation that they finally wake up and, and then see, you know, that Jesus, you know, is and was their Messiah. <clears throat> well, I've read this verse to before, but let's look at, uh, turn to Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 9. So Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 9. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 9. 
This verse here is referring to the, the end of the, the, tri the Great Tribulation. Get one page back. And so, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. You know, and if you looked at the, the rest of the context, you'll see two-thirds of the Jewish people, when the tribulation starts, two-thirds of whatever Jews are here on earth are going to be killed. Only one-third of them will end up getting saved there at the end. Now, that doesn't mean maybe a few of those individual ones, but as it, a whole, that two-thirds of those are going to die and go to hell. One-third will get saved as they call upon Jesus. You know, Jesus, they'll finally see that Jesus was the one whom they pierced. You know, there's other scriptures to talk about that and so forth. But back there in Ze uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, let's look at verse 9. So Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Now, verses 9 through 17, you know, when we look at this, this next section here, then verses 9 through 17 seem to be speaking of the millennium. You know, that's what, what's going to happen. That's when they'll all get this language. I mean, like right now, they speak Hebrew, but there's a lot of Jews that, you know, have been for years and years, you know, millions of Jews from all over the world have been coming back to Israel. I mentioned that the other day, that, that uh, you know, right now what's going on in Ukraine, some of those Ukrainian Jews you know, have been all heading back over to Israel. You know, they're all getting out of there because of the war. And they're all moving to Israel. So, you know, they've been coming in. But, you know, a lot of these people, they don't speak Hebrew or anything right now. They speak their native language, whatever it may be, Russian or, you know, Ukrainian or, you know, wherever they're coming from, you know, German or something like that. So, uh, but it, there's going to come a point where, you know, they're all going to speak. And the thing is, I think, that, you know, all people are going to end up speaking Hebrew during the millennium. It's not going to just be the uh, Israelites. You know, that, you know, God refers to Hebrew as a pure language because that's mentioned that before. I believe it was the original language of Adam and Eve. As I said, it seems that at this time during speaking of the millennium, all nations will once again speak one language, which will be a pure language. You know, everyone spoke one language until the dispersion at the Tower of Babel when God formed the nations and the languages. Here he basically reverses that curse. You know, you see where part of the curse starts getting removed during the uh, millennium. You know, it's not completely removed, but there, there's parts of it. Remember, like, the child playing with the serpent and so forth. It says an ass, but then he sticks his hand in the hole and so forth, you know. And, and you know, nobody worries about it because it... You know, it's not like today. It's the same thing. That, you know, originally there was one language. As I said, I believe it was Hebrew. And then, of course, we studied the Genesis there. Then we studied about the Tower of Babel. And then how God dispersed the languages. But now he's kind of bringing that back where everybody's going to be speaking one language again. And as I said, I believe the pure language at first everyone speaking Hebrew which I believe was the original language spoken by everyone until the Tower of Babel. Now, people will once again speak a pure language. You know, there, there are many things, if you really study the Hebrew, you'll understand why it's considered a pure language, too, and why it makes sense, too. That, that uh, I mean, first of all, it's God's chosen people. Why would he have them not, you know, he would have maintained that pure language. He would have them speak something else. If it was English, for example, he would, they'd be speaking English. They wouldn't be speaking Hebrew. But this verse also shows how all people may call on the name of the Lord to serve him as one. You know, it's not just for the Jewish people or just for Gentiles. Anybody that wants to can call upon the name of the Lord. And especially during the millennium where Jesus will be physically ruling and reigning right here on earth in Jerusalem. But when the millennium starts, only believers will initially be there. You know, God will already have separated the nations as sheep and goats, or in other words, the saved and unsaved nations. You know, that's that sheep and goat judgment, you know, the sheep on the right and the goats on the left and so forth. You know, that God he judges all the nations. And, you know, so remember when, when, the, when the tribulation ends, you know, you get the Christians that get raptured out, then you have... 
the tribulation comes to an end, and during that battle, you're going to have people that have gotten saved during the tribulation that will end up surviving. They will not have died in battle Armageddon or any other way. They won't have been decapitated by, uh, you know, beheaded by the uh, Antichrist with guillotine or whatever and stuff. And then you'll have those that took the mark of the beast that are the unsaved, that some of them also will survive the battle Armageddon and so forth. But then those, then remember, God, you know, judges them, casts them off into to hell, except for the uh, Antichrist and the false prophet, whom he casts directly into the lake of fire. They, they kind of pass go and go directly to the lake of fire because they're so evil they don't even get to go to hell. And then the, uh, so when, when the millennium starts, you have all those believers that were in their natural body, and they just survived, they go into the, to the millennium. But then you also have all true believers, both the Old Testament and New Testament saints that have already died, then we'll, we'll all have our glorified, resurrected bodies, and we're the ones that will be rolling and reigning, you know, over those people that go into land. Because right now they're saved, but as they have children, they're going to, you know, have children. Those will be unsaved, and they will see at the end, they'll, they'll rebel as the sand of the sea. That's how much rebellion will be. But that's, you know, that's what the job of people will be, is we'll be trying to witness to these people that, that are going to be unsaved. But initially, when the, when the millennium starts, there's only saved people. Now, the tribulation is just the opposite. You have unsaved people. But we're going to stop there. We'll pick it up next week, and uh, we'll go from there. So next week, we'll look at start Zephaniah we'll be on chapter 3 and we'll start at verse 10. But we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this time, once again, coming in tonight. We continue to pray for safety for each and every one as they leave here tonight. Pray for safe return on Sunday. And Father, we do pray, as I said, about the cars, that be able to get those cars working and that uh, no one will have any more issues. And just be with each and every one in this church, whatever it may be, whether it's their health or just their homes or just their cars or just people, they won't have any more problems and issues. And just... Uh, be with those families that are on our prayer list and the one we mentioned earlier and the Estes family and so forth. And Father, we just ask all your blessings on the evening and be uh, thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.